When school teacher Stephanie Scott went missing only one week before she was due to get married, her friends and family instantly knew that something had gone terribly wrong. Public concern grew for the young, beautiful, bubbly bride-to-be, and the tight-knit community of Leeton, Australia all came together in the desperate search to bring her home. Vincent Stanford, a cleaner who worked at the high school where Stephanie was a teacher, became a person of interest in the case and a search of his home soon revealed why. This is the callous and senseless murder of Stephanie Scott. Before I get on with today's video, I want to thank my sponsor, June's Journey. So June's Journey is a free to download mobile game. It is a captivating hidden object mystery game. It takes you back to the 1920s. It's got to be one of my favorite eras ever with beautiful glamour scenes and a riveting murder mystery storyline. June's Journey is a superb way to help you relax and also to challenge your observational skills and problem solving. Now I know that as we all love true crime, Loads of you are going to absolutely adore this game. It's thrilling. It's based on June Parker, who's on a quest to solve the murder of her sister. And you basically have to solve clues and find objects that are hidden all throughout hundreds of beautiful and carefully painted scenes. Me and Pete have been playing this. Not going to lie. I think I'm better. He doesn't necessarily believe it. And it does help us relax, surprisingly, as we're going to sleep, mostly because of my superiority complex, where I believe I'm just doing a far better job than he is. And from the outset, it gets you basically talking about who could have been the culprit within the story. And at the end of the day, let's all agree, I'm going to be better at this game than my husband. I know loads of you are going to really enjoy it, so I'm going to leave you a link in the description where you can download June's Journey for free on Android, iOS and PC through Facebook games. Now get detecting, that's what you're good for. Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. I am going to say, just from the get-go, that I may be a little bit jet-lagged. I may halfway through this particular video start talking gibberish and if i do i apologize in advance i've been out to visit my son who's been fighting in thailand i don't just mean fighting on the streets he's not out there being some kind of rebel some kind of public disturbance he's genuinely been thai boxing out there and don't want to brag but he won he won I'm saying that like I was there. Of course I wasn't there. I was at my hotel, scared watching a Facebook stream whilst looking after my baby daughter because at 11 p.m. in a boxing area, it's probably not the right place for your young kid to be. But I only got off the plane not so long ago and I'm filming this. So apologies if my energy is not what it should be. Hopefully it will be. Honestly, I have that catchphrase, crime and consistency, don't I? And um, by George, it will always, is it by George or is it by Scott? I think it's by George. Hello, Chase. I'm always going to be consistent. So Wednesdays and Sundays, I will be releasing my crime content. And if you're new to this channel and you're thinking, sorry, <laughs> thought this was a crime channel. She's going on about Thai boxing and talking gibberish. You'll now understand why. Or if you don't, apologies. Right. Let's get on with today's story, which is just so tragic. And also, when I was researching this, I just kept feeling really angry. I think every case that I do is always desperately sad. Of course, it's desperately sad. We're talking about people losing their lives. But there are some cases, and it strikes you that your day, your average day, where you're just going about your business, working in an environment that you've always considered safe all it takes is a predator 
to have access to that environment. And not just your life can invariably change, and in this case, be snuffed out, but the impact that it has on the people that you love, on the future that was going to be yours and with those people who care deeply for you. And this case highlights that massively, that you can genuinely be somewhere that you would every single day of your life consider safe. And even in those circumstances, find yourself in the most horrific harm. And where Stephanie Scott is concerned, that is absolutely the case. So who was Stephanie Claire Scott? Well, she was born in Sydney, she was born on the 14th of October 1988. She was born to her parents, Marilyn and Bob Scott. Bob worked as a teacher and he actually became a deputy principal at Kalawindra High School. She also had two brothers and two sisters. So a nice, wholesome family, quite a big sibling group. And she was absolutely adored. When people talk about who she was as a human being, she's described as being very warm, very loving, very bubbly, and that she was an individual that you would describe as vibrant. And whenever I think about the word vibrant, I think about colourful. I think about a whole stream of traits that go with that word. Because sometimes the singular word, even though it embodies so much, doesn't seem enough. So I think when we're talking about Stephanie, she was somebody who could light up a room, who was colourful in the way that she was, and who basically was an individual you would notice when you came into contact with her because she was just so lovely. Apparently you could talk to her about anything, she wouldn't judge you, and she was always somebody who went out of her way to try to help other people. Apparently she was incredibly kind, she was incredibly thoughtful and one of the things that is clear from the pictures that you see of her but also from the testimony essentially of the people that loved her is that she had this really huge smile and I feel like a smile is a universal language. We know primordially the reason that we smile is because we're bearing teeth in a positive way which means that we're not being threatening and I also appreciate that some people will be like well some people can smile in a sinister way. Yes but that's a sinister smile and it looks different to a happy joyful smile. So a smile is a universal connector. You don't need to be able to converse in any way shape or form to acknowledge in a moment where somebody smiles at you that they are being nice and that you don't have to be that fearful of them. And so she had one of those smiles that lit up the room. And again, it resonates that she was just a really kind person. When her mum talked about her, as sadly relatives do, when lives are lost, she described her as being wise beyond her years, really compassionate. She was somebody who encouraged empathy in others and was also empathetic herself. She was very reliable. She was said to be inspirational. And her mother said that she was a real mentor and role model and that she was an individual who literally abhorred any cruelty of any kind, but she had a, a particular disdain for children and animals being harmed. So I think every single one of us who comes to this channel and myself, the person who presents it, we all agree on that, that even though every life has infinite meaning and no one should endure cruelty, when somebody is nasty to children or animals, it kind of says something about their character and personality because they are the most vulnerable creatures and beings. And if you can harm them, well, you can harm anyone. So Stephanie was an all round good human being. And she was in a long-term relationship, a really great relationship with a guy called Aaron Leeson Woolley. And they had been together a while. They'd met at school in Kalawindra and they'd actually began their relationship as friends. But at Aaron's 21st birthday party, they got together, they started a romance. And they eventually moved to Leeton, which is a small town in New South Wales, Australia. And Stephanie at that point, she starts to follow essentially in her father's footsteps, which must have been an incredibly proud thing for her dad to see. So she trained to be a teacher. And I know that lots of us look at our parents' lives and respect what they do. But I don't think it's very often that we try to emulate what they do. And you can just automatically see that she would have been brought up with a parent who loved what he did and because he loved what he did 
and she probably heard so much about how much she enjoyed teaching that she decided that that was where her vocation lay. And I also think, again, it's testament to a real close relationship because when you admire and respect a parent, you want to follow in their footsteps to some degree because you just have such a connection with them. So again, that's resonating with a reality of connection within their family. Once she actually qualified, she taught English and drama at Leeton High School. And according to all sources, teaching was far more than just a job to her. She was incredibly passionate about it. She really cared about her students. And her students said that one of the things that was really important to them was the fact that she made them feel that they were seen, that they were visible, that she had this really warm personality and that made her really popular with her students, but also it made her popular with colleagues because we all like a colleague like that, don't we? Somebody who can just walk in, beam with a smile, remind us of our vocation and make our day better. And that's something that she had the power to do. And people who knew her had the privilege of that experience. Now we get to April the 11th, 2014, and a really happy event occurs. Stephanie and Aaron get engaged. And they planned the wedding for the following year. It was going to be on the 11th of April, 2015. And apparently Stephanie really enjoyed planning her wedding and basically made sure she considered every single last detail. And again, that speaks volumes. That talks about an individual who dedicates herself and commits herself to a project. It's also probably one of the reasons why she was such an amazing teacher, because she was able to dedicate herself in that way. What I'm saying is she's not the kind of person who would just leave everything to their mother and then buy a dress and turn up on the day. Like, I don't know, I might have done. I didn't even know that the car was gold when it turned up. Apparently there was a gold theme. But anyway, that's what happens when you're too lazy to plan your wedding. That's probably also why my first marriage broke down. Anyway, I digress. So at this point, she's everything going for her. A great career. Everybody adores her. She's got a really loving partner and they are planning their future together. And she wanted to make sure when she was planning that wedding that it wasn't just about her. She wanted to ensure that every single guest would enjoy the day as much as she would, which is just testament to the kind of person I'm talking about. Because can we be honest, there are a lot of bridezillas out there. There are a lot of people out there who really don't care what you've served for your meal or how long the speeches last even when some of the speeches don't really need to last that long at all. Just a bit of advice out there. Just a short speech or an emotional speech, nothing else. They're the things that work. But for her, she genuinely wanted to plan it in a way where everybody enjoyed it. And apparently her and Aaron were even taking dance classes so that they could ace the first dance. And I think that also speaks volumes about their relationship. I know they were getting married, but when people really think about what that day is going to be about and how they want to start their life together. Doing something synchronized in such a way, it bodes really well. That even booked their honeymoon, they were going to go to Tahiti, which is a place that I'm sure each and every one of us can imagine would be the most perfect place for any couple in love to go. But that's not going to happen. None of what I've described is ever going to come to fruition. That wedding that she so meticulously planned, that honeymoon that she so richly deserved, it's not going to ever take place. On April the 3rd, 2015, Aaron went on a trip to Kalawindra for the Easter weekend. His friend was having a party, so he went to attend that party and then he was going to stay at his parents' house. Stephanie wasn't actually joining him on that trip because she was really busy with work and also she had the wedding plans to finalise. But the couple were texting each other all the way through. They were incredibly loved up. On April the 5th, 2015, Stephanie, the absolutely dedicated teacher that she was, she goes into school. She goes into school to do some work because she knew that she was going to be away. At the end of the day, when you get married and have a honeymoon, you are going to be 
away. But unlike, I don't know, the mass majority of us who could just allow ourselves that freedom, she didn't feel entitled to it in the way that somebody like myself would. As a substitute teacher was going to be providing cover for her while she was on the honeymoon, she wanted to make absolutely sure that all the work preparation for her students was done so they didn't miss out when she was away enjoying herself. That demonstrates what an incredibly dedicated teacher she was. She got into work on a Sunday over the holiday weekend just to ensure that her students wouldn't be negatively affected by her being away. And again, it speaks volumes about her nature. She texted her fiance to let him know what she was doing, what she was intending to do that day. But when he tried to call her later in the afternoon, she just didn't pick up the phone. And that was really unusual. It bothered him. But again, he's putting it down to her likely doing something where plans were concerned and not being aware of the phone. Or maybe she was just working later and had it on silent. There are a million reasons why she may not have picked up, but it didn't sit well with him. So later that evening, this is around 7.30 p.m., Aaron returned home and Stephanie wasn't there. Her car wasn't there either. And even more worryingly for him, she still hadn't replied to his text. And by this point, he called her several times. And this is totally unusual. This is not in keeping with her behavior. But he tried to rationalize it. Well, maybe she just needs a little space. We all get stressed when we think about weddings. We all acknowledge that weddings can be a highly problematic time on a psychological level because there is so much to play for in that situation. So he tries to relax and not give in to those nerves that are bubbling. But at the same time, he realizes that it would be unlikely she'd be highly stressed because by all accounts, she was really excited for a big day. And she'd also really enjoyed the wedding planning process. But we all know what that's like, don't we? In a situation where somebody is acting out of character, we can't get hold of them, we are concerned because they've not turned up in a particular place. We're always going to go down that rational route. Well, it's going to be okay because of ABC. We don't want to think about worst case scenarios. Some of you may recognize that you catastrophize it's an anxiety response but for the most part even when you're an individual who does that we teach you not to we teach you that it's rarely your worst case scenario and Aaron tries to do that himself unfortunately though on this occasion it's going to be far worse than any scenario is probably thought of in reality we get to the following day it's April the 6th, 2015. Bear in mind, Stephanie does not disappear. She wouldn't ever consider not answering the phone, disappearing for a night by herself. But that's what's happened. So Aaron's now really concerned. Stephanie hasn't arrived back home. He's starting to get really fearful. So he starts to call friends and family and he wants to know, do you have any information about where she is? Have you heard where she's going? Has she told you something that I don't know? But then he starts to search for her, drives around, but can't find her. And I cannot even begin to imagine where his thoughts and feelings would have been in that moment. But you know, he would have been thinking potentially something awful has happened. Also, Stephanie hasn't at this point accessed her bank account since she disappeared and that's really worrying because we know we look for signs of life. Maybe a mobile phone going off, maybe a friend who's seen them, a witness who's noticed them, and of course, money that's been taken out. All of those things give you vital insight as to whether you really need to be deeply concerned about an individual who's gone missing or maybe they've gone missing of their own volition. But where Stephanie's concerned, no information is standing out that she has left voluntarily to go anywhere or do anything. At this point, Aaron reports Stephanie missing to the police that afternoon. And they, at that point, are wondering whether maybe she got into a car accident after leaving the school because her car wasn't at home. And that's their first port of call to try to locate the actual vehicle. So the police launch appeals. Aaron takes part in interviews with reporters anything to bring his gorgeous girlfriend, fiance, soon to be wife back home to him. And then a search begins, all desperate to locate the missing bride-to-be. 
Now, it's established early on that Stephanie had last been seen, as far as anyone could tell, at the high school that was on Easter Sunday. Like I said, she was very committed Easter Sunday. It's a holiday and it's a special holiday and she was in work. It's not just a weekend. This is a woman going out of her way to meet the needs of her students. And what is really ultimately devastating is that that choice, that choice to care that deeply about her students, to make sure that work was prepared, ultimately that's the decision that leads to her demise. She's not responsible for it. But isn't it devastating when you consider that that natural desire to make sure that she was the best teacher and to provide the best service and education for her children that she was teaching, that was the chink in her armour. When they find out that that's the last time she was seen, a passerby actually reported that she had seen Stephanie's car parked under a covered walkway that day and that she had passed the high school around 2 p.m. And this is something that I'm going to struggle with when I tell you. Because she said that she passed the school around 2 p.m. And at that point, she'd heard sounds like something was being dragged across the floor. Again, I'm not blaming this individual for not doing anything about it, but 2 p.m. at a high school, hearing something that sounds like it's being dragged across the floor, that isn't likely to be a noise that you would hear, particularly on Easter Sunday. Things like that are things that we should react to. It's far better to make a call to emergency services and say, I think something might be going wrong here. I think something bad might be happening here. I don't know. But it just feels like on an intuition level, something is out of context. But People tend to believe in the bias of security and think that terrible things aren't happening and understandably, to some degree, this person doesn't act on it. But the very fact that that individual comes forward and states that they have heard this means it has to have been out of the ordinary, extraordinary even, because why else would you remember it? I've walked past a million places. I've never heard something that was so unusual and out of character for that context that I remembered it. It says something, doesn't it? It says sometimes we need to risk making a mistake if that mistake could save somebody or if that mistake could help the authorities when it comes down to investigating crimes. When the police actually speak to the deputy principal of the school, obviously they're trying to figure out where she was last, whether she was with anyone, they actually say that there was a cleaner present at that school on Good Friday. And that was 24-year-old Vincent Stanford. And then another witness, they said that they'd seen a white car at the school on the Sunday. Now, Vincent had only actually started working at the school on a five-week relief contract. And although this had actually been set to finish on the 2nd of April, it had been extended. So... He was an individual with access to the vicinity where she was last seen. Now, Vincent Stanford was somebody who had actually been born in Australia, but then he'd moved to the Netherlands at a really young age, but then he'd come back to Australia. And I've watched his interrogations and he does have quite an unusual accent. You can certainly hear the influence of his European experience along with his Australian accent. Now, when police speak to Vincent, he said, yeah, I was at the school briefly. I put the bins out, but didn't see Stephanie. And then he actually said to the police, good luck with your search. I find that really weird. Honestly, if somebody has gone missing from the school that you are working at, albeit on a temporary contract, and the police come along saying, have you seen this individual? And even if the answer is no, saying good luck with your search it dissolves you of any responsibility. How about, how can I help? What can I do? Is there an opportunity for me to join in? The very fact that it's good luck with your search, there is a sinister undertone, isn't there? 
Because if you're the perpetrator who's brought great harm to an individual and the police are speaking to you and then you add the words good luck with your search, on a psychological level, I feel like he's toying with the officers. I appreciate some people will say, no, he's deflecting. What he's saying is, oh, good luck with your search. I'm going to look like a great citizen by acknowledging that this girl needs to be returned and I hope it's all going to be fine. But for me, good luck with your search. You know, the sinister undertone, you know that they're not going to find her and bring her home alive. So it's the power within that exchange. He knows everything. They know nothing in that moment. And he's the one in control. So he claimed that after he'd been to school, he'd actually gone food shopping at a place called the Golden Apple Supermarket. Now this immediately concerned the police. And the reason that it concerned the police was because they knew that the Golden Apple Supermarket had been closed that day. And in fact, it's closed every Sunday, let alone when we're talking about the Easter holiday, it is closed every single Sunday. So he may have picked out an appropriate alibi in his mindset, but the truth is, is immediately created a stumbling block. He doesn't realize that that shop is closed. Also, of course, we know that the last person who thought that maybe they'd heard dragging sounds had also noted that there was a white car. He had a white ute. In fact, it matched the description of the car that had been spotted at the school. Another thing that was a big indicator and concern is he had scratches on his face. So ultimately, as much as he's saying good luck to the officers, everything about who he is is making him a suspect. And like I said, sometimes we do get scratches on our face. Sometimes our cat, for example. I don't know where mine is in the room. Where are you, Chase? Oh, you're under my chair. Sorry, that weird call. That was so weird. I went, didn't I? I'm just going to have to acknowledge that that's my cat call. Can I have it noted at this point before I carry on that it's not really my cat call, but my father invented it. Oh, my father invented the cat call. That's right. I liberated two kittens when I was 10 years old. And when I say liberated, I genuinely mean it. I hid them in the garage and fed them until they were found because back in the day, people drowned kittens. My friend's mum was gonna drown the kittens. And so I liberated all seven of them in fact, but I forgot to rehome two of them and spent all my little bits of spending money that my nan used to give me on a Thursday on cat food. Also, baking trays, not the best thing to use for a Cattler. Anyway, I got caught. It didn't end well for me initially. I was in a lot of trouble. But then my dad let me keep them both. So I ended up with Scrappy and Smudge, not Chase and Ace or Blue, the ones that I've got. I'm talking about the fact that back then, that's the call that he created for them. So I apologise for that. <laughs> I wouldn't suggest repeating it. And it does things like this. Anyway, I digress. Like I'm saying, if you've got animals, they may well occasionally bite you on the nose like this one does. That was like I'm some kind of a cat trainer. He does do that, but well done, Chase. On cue. Thank you so much. Anyway, you can get scratches on your face when you've got dogs and cats or when you've got gardening going on. You know, that happens, but to have that tallied with the fact that he suggested that at the end of the day, the shop that was going to be open wasn't open. It's immediately making the police very, very suspicious. So then we get to April the 8th, it's 2015, and the police feel that they need to go and interview Vincent again. He actually lived with his mother and also his older brother, Luke. And although he wasn't actually home when the police came by, his mum obviously feels that, that she has no reason to not allow the police to come in because as far as she's concerned she knows a child so she's not going to be thinking that he's got anything to do with the disappearance of a woman so she opens the door they ask whether they can search the property and she says yeah but of course that's because Vincent wasn't there it would have been a whole different story wouldn't it 
if the police had come knocking and asked to search the home and he had had the power and control to simply say no. And as they start moving through the rooms, well, there's some really disturbing items that they find. So first of all, they find Stephanie's keys on a lanyard. They also find her red bra. They also found items including a used condom, some yellow tape, a set of handcuffs and a lubricant bottle. All of those, by the way, later down the line, happen to contain Stephanie's blood and DNA. And when you just think about what I said, when you consider the items and the fact that they ended up with her DNA on it and blood, I can't even begin to envisage what her final moments would have been like. We know terror, we know fear, but there's humiliation, degradation. There's all of those things that an individual does when there is a sexual motive as well as a murderous motive. They also found a knife and they were able to identify that that was indeed a murder weapon, also had Stephanie's blood on it. Now, the police are searching for all this material and Vincent returns home. Now, at this point, he actually says to the police that he'd been out taking photos on his camera and that was why he wasn't present and that his camera was in his car. He also said that it was okay if the police looked at his camera and that was a strange move because what is on the camera is truly harrowing because it contained pictures of the body. And one has to ask themselves, why would Vincent actually invite the police to look at that camera? And I think we can give several realities as to why that may have been. So it could be that he genuinely feels that by inviting them to look on the camera, he's going to seem innocent. It could be that he genuinely is proud of his work and he knows the game's up. They've been in the house. They've found a bra, they'll potentially have DNA and he's going to be discovered and therefore he may as well be honest and let them see the pictures as well. It could be a macabre level of enjoyment to know just as he traumatised her, now he's going to traumatise them. It could be pride. It could be that actually he's glad of the work and the killing they carried out it could be a mix of all of those things but he lets them see it they also found blood on some sheet wood in his car and that was later of course confirmed to be stephanie's so at this point vincent is arrested of course he is although he did initially try to say that the photographs were from a horror film but clearly that isn't true he said that he downloaded this film because he found them funny and that they weren't actually of Stephanie. But like I said, put yourself into the position where you are actually a killer, a violent sexual predator who's carried out the most heinous killing. And the police come and they've got evidence because they've been into your room and they've collected that information and they're linking you to the crime. And then you suggest that they look at your camera. And even if you had indeed downloaded pictures from a horror movie and wanted them to see that, and you then say, well, it wasn't actually Stephanie, I just thought they were really funny. So I downloaded them, they're not actually of her. What kind of mental process would you be going through? In the moment where you are bang to right, you are going to go down for a very long time for the murder, the sexually, predated murder of this poor young woman, this gorgeous teacher. The thing you're thinking about is let's have a bit of comedy. Look at these pictures, not really of her, but they're really funny. It speaks of a personality so broken and a mindset devoid of empathy that it's blindsiding on every level. Obviously, Vincent's technology gets taken away, his computer's taken away, his evidence, and when they actually look at it, and get the information off it, it is horrific. There's so much disturbing content on there. And 
it demonstrates that what we are dealing with, where Vincent is concerned, is a deeply depraved, violent predator of a magnitude that is rare. A magnitude that should he have been left to his own devices for much longer, other bodies would have turned up. So it turned out that aside from murdering poor Stephanie, he'd been stalking a 12 year old girl she's referred to as Joanne because they want to obviously protect her identity. Also, he was stalking another two women who worked in retail and Vincent had footage of Joanne, the young girl, as well as 1,805 photos of her on his camera and computer, many of which she was wearing school uniform in. So he clearly liked children as well. And bear in mind, this guy got a job at a school. This guy had placed himself perfectly in the environment where he was attracted to a particular cohort. These twisted individuals, they are so effective at inserting themselves in places and spaces where their victim profile exists. The idea of the thoughts that were manifesting in his mind when he was being paid to clean at that place, terrifying. Also, they turned up an exercise book, and in that exercise book, it was all documenting that young girl's movement, such as the time that she was home alone, such as the time that she got home, and scarily, and it is just horrific, on one page, he'd written, home alone, 1540, time enough to abduct. So this guy wasn't living in fantasy, because we can tell, because of the crime uncovering today. Joanne's life, without a shadow of a doubt, was in danger. He'd also referred to her as a slut, so huge amount of misogyny within that. And we have to acknowledge that in these types of crimes, very often, the predators, they see women as objects and they project all of this negativity and belief system that these individuals are deserving of whatever happens to them on a sexual level because they feel this rage towards females. They feel potentially because they're not capable of achieving a reasonable relationship that they should be able to take it. Or it gives them a permission base because, hey, that person is deserving of this because they are a slut. So the very fact that he's formulating that this child fits these categories is both diabolical but very very evident of his feelings towards females he'd also written down the registration plate numbers of cars that were driven by her family members so he was tracking her and that's the thing about stalking very often stalking leads onto an escalation we talk about stalking as if it's in this kind of separate category as if when somebody is physically stalking you, and I use the words physically stalking you on purpose because there is a massive distinction between physical and cyber. It's awful to be cyber stalked, believe me. Believe me, it's happened to me. I've been cyber stalked by very odd people. I'm talking about physical stalking where somebody is following you and you're trying to get people to listen to one, how that's making you feel, but secondly, how the danger is getting closer step by step. And I've covered on this channel cases where women have asked for help and gotten on and they ended up on this channel because they were murdered. So Vincent, within this behaviour, is graduating. He's graduating to something utterly diabolical and numerous. Bear in mind, he's caught because of Stephanie, but that's not where it would have ended. And potentially, it's not where it's just been. Because who knows what he could have done prior to this. Now, disturbingly, Vincent actually later said that if he had abducted Joanne, he most likely would have killed her. That young girl was 100% unaware that as she was just going about the motions, as she was going to school, as she was being picked up by a mum or a dad, meeting with friends, that her life was genuinely in the balance and that at any moment, this man could have struck and struck in the most diabolical of ways. She was oblivious to the danger that she'd been in, but she really was in that danger. Also, when they look at the searches, which they always do, and they forensically analyze the computers and the phones of these 
predators. Of course, he was searching for the most violent things that you would imagine someone to search with this kind of mindset. So he was searching for violent rape, violent sex, hardcore porn, murder, necrophilia, and necro rape. And if that isn't bad enough, he was also somebody who had a plethora of photos of schoolgirls, women, and bestiality. And now I'm the first person to acknowledge that lots of people use pornography. I get it. I am not going to come on this channel and say that people who watch pornography are twisted or broken. It would be totally misrepresentative of the reality. But let me tell you, do I believe for one moment that things like violent sex, hardcore porn, murder, necrophilia, violent rape, things like that on a pornography level, not a reality level, but on a pornography level, should ever be allowed to be shown 100% they shouldn't be. And it's because whilst 99.9% .9 of people can watch any kind of footage, even this kind of horrific stuff that I've just mentioned, and not become some kind of horrendous predator, if you are somebody with the appetite, the predilection for this kind of material, and then you are fed it and fed it and fed it, then it's not going to be enough in the long term. That high that you get initially from connecting with it, it's going to want to be acted out in different ways. You know, if you're watching pornography, that is a couple having fun, really enjoying one another, where both parties seem to be getting a lot of enjoyment out of it. Well, hey, what's the worst that's going to happen when you get involved in a sexual relationship? You probably want to want to bring pleasure to them and have pleasure brought to you, right? Because that's the increment. That's the next stage. You're watching people enjoy themselves. You want to enjoy yourself. But when we're talking about this kind of material, I would ban it tomorrow. And I'd ban it for good reason. I'd ban it for very good reason. I'd ban it because I've had to work with young men. And I'm talking about young men, 16, 17, 18, who can't get a hard on because the only way they think they can enjoy sex is by choking a female. You have to work with desensitization with them so that they can actually get aroused in normal sex. We have such a duty and responsibility to the world around us to understand the impact. And like I said, I'm not saying pornography is a terrible thing. Some of you will think it is. Some of you will think it's great. I mean, this kind of material, it speaks volumes about the individual who is searching for it. It is not normal. It is absolutely a paraphilia and it is deeply disturbing. And people should seek help if that's their area. And this demonstrates that he is constantly pumping himself with these images these ideas, these possibilities. Also, Vincent's search history showed that on the day, literally the day of Stephanie's murder, he'd searched bride rape and bride rate with wedding gown. I genuinely despair at the fact that searching for that would give you some kind of return on your search. What kind of a society are we when you can actually have videos given to you that depict something so grotesque? Anything that depicts somebody in pain, albeit if that is acted out, when it comes down to pornography, that should not be allowed. And I know people will say, well, there are films out there where this kind of issue is depicted, but it's not sensationalized in the way that it is in porn, because we all know how it works in porn, don't we? You know, she goes through the pain, she goes through the trauma within it, and then suddenly she really likes it, and hey, it's all fine, she's having a great time. It's grotesque. I've done a lot of sex research, by the way, so I'm not just saying stuff. I'm coming from a psychological perspective with an understanding of psychological and physiological impact. It should not exist. It is wrong. He also searched serial killer knives, sharpest knife you can buy and he also searched widow maker that is just so brutal because this gorgeous young woman 
whose smile could light up a room, whose dedication to her children that were taught by her meant that she was present on this day. These literally fit the description of what would happen if she was lost. Widowmaker. The next day, it's April the 9th at this point, of course, Vincent's charged with Stephanie's murder. They haven't found a body. We all know that it's quite difficult to charge somebody with murder if you do not have a body. But let's be honest, the information that they've got, the connection with her disappearance from the witness to the items found at his property, they all demonstrate that he is guilty as hell. They do manage then to locate Stephanie's car. It's actually located on a paddock near a farm. When they found the car, it was very obvious that something terrible had happened because there was a large amount of blood in the actual car, but also a large amount, particularly in the boots. It didn't take long for them to confirm that that was Stephanie's blood. They knew, but they have to confirm these things. And I just take a step back in these moments, and I have to because... It's really easy to just say the words. I'm not saying that I don't feel when I'm speaking this story, but it's easy to say the words, so to speak, without sometimes taking a breath. Just taking a breath to acknowledge that what we're actually talking about. We're talking about a young woman with so much potential going into work on a non-work day and now her blood has drenched her car. It's inconceivable that human beings can do this to one another, but they do. All Stephanie was doing was the best by the people she cared for. And this is how her story ends. Just taking that moment to acknowledge that when we're talking about the blood, we're talking about the ebbing away of this incredible woman's life. We get to April the 10th, 2015. So this was just one day before she was gonna get married. And both fortunately and to some degree unfortunately because of how she was found, but fortunately because there is nothing worse than not having the closure of where your child or partner is. And even when the closure is torture, that torture is more bearable than not knowing. So one day, April the 10th, just before she was gonna get married, the police discover what was left of her body in Kakapara National Park. The reason that they only found part of her body was because basically she was badly burnt. Basically, her burnt remains had been left near a remote dirt track, just disregarded, disposed of. Again, testament, isn't it, to the way that these killers are around human worth. So they can go ahead and live out and play out their most depraved and dark fantasy on a living, breathing human being, on a person with so much to look forward to, and then once they've done what they desired, just throw that person away. That person of incalculable value, that person loved beyond measure. They do it so easily. And on the same day that her body was found, a witness also came forward to say that they'd actually seen a man throwing a laptop into Main Canal. And the man who was seen throwing the laptop was then seen driving away in a white car, which of course, as you will all have guessed, was similar, if not exactly the same, to Vincent's. The next day on April the 11th, 2015, which of course was their day, the day that she was meant to marry her and the love of her life. Instead, the police were diving, searching that area that the witness had seen the laptop being thrown in. And then the next day, they managed to retrieve Stephanie's work laptop from the water. When you think about nightmares, what I'm talking about right now, it's like the worst and most terrifying plot of a movie, isn't it? When these kind of dates coincide, 
the moment that she's going to be walking down the aisle, divers are trying to retrieve from the murky waters evidence of who killed her. Vincent asked to be interviewed from prison because he decided that he wanted to volunteer information. And let me tell you guys, when you listen to a bit of what he says, you are going to be pretty stunned at the way he comes across. When I've watched his interview, what sticks with me is not the nonchalance, because I don't think that's the correct word. It's the directness. And there's going to be reasons why people suggest that he is this direct. But there is something so inhumane when he's talking. And you can feel it. You can hear the detectives finding it easy to get the information because he wants to give it. But it's blindsiding them. His responses just seem so easy. Like water off a duck's back. No emotion, no fear, no anxiety, just this is what happened. Like I'm talking to you right now. In fact, that's incorrect because I have emotion. Okay, so when you've taken her out of the boot, did you take the clothes off her in the boot or did you take clothes off her in the ground? On the ground. On the ground? Yeah. Okay. Now, obviously, she had, at this stage, there was a lot of blood and... Did she have injuries to her face? Did you notice any swelling or...? Yeah, the right side of her face. Yep. It's quite... Up near her eye. Yep. And that's from when you punched her when she was yeah. around? Yeah. Okay. Um, and you said you threw some wood on her? Or yeah. branches and stuff? And then did you put the fuel on after that or did you put the fuel on before? After that. After that. Okay. And you put her clothes back in the car? Yeah in the boot okay so then you what did you did you use match to light the fire or did you use cigarette put some petrol on the stick and I laid a match on that yep and I chucked the stick on there yep and where did the match what about the match where did you put it I think it's still there probably did you throw that in the fire or just drop it no I dropped it where the stick was okay is that far away from the body or no 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 okay um so when you travelled, did you stay around long to watch your body burn? Or? No, I left straight away. You left straight away? Now, so was it well alight? Was the body well alight when you left or you didn't take much notice? Or? Yeah, it was well alight. took a second, petrol starts fast. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then you travelled home. Which way did you go home? Same route. Same route? Yeah. I think I went in... Put a car on Pike Road. Yep. And I walked the rest of the way back home. What about her earrings engagement ring? Don't know, I might have taken that off earlier. Earlier? Where did you take those off? Probably when I was at home with her. No. When I went and collected all her stuff at the high school. Would have been. Not her earrings though. But her engagement ring, you remember taking that? Yeah. Where'd the you, high school. Where'd you put her engagement ring? Well, no. Chucked so much stuff out. Yep. So you did, you got rid of that with the clothes, did you, or...? I was chucked it in a bin somewhere when I chucked everything else out, but... Okay. okay so, um, but you do remember taking an engagement ring off a finger? Yeah, she so wore school. two rings. Wore two rings? On the same finger, were they, or...? No, different fingers. Yeah, what fingers were they on, do you remember? On the no, right index finger and the other on the left, I think. Right index or no, this one. ring finger? What, yeah, yeah, ring fingers. Okay, so, and you took those off at the school? Yeah. When, after you walked back or before you went home the first time? Um, before I went home, when I collected all her stuff, I think. Okay. Why did you take the engagement ring off then? I don't know, I was just scrounging up her stuff. Make sure I didn't leave anything behind. Okay, so it was in her handbag in your cupboard then at some point, her engagement ring? Would have been, yeah. Yep. Do you remember when you went home that afternoon to go through her stuff? Did you remember seeing the engagement ring? Yeah, it would have still been in the bag. You didn't mention it before, that's all. You mentioned other things like her credit cards, wallet. Oh, sorry. Yep. 
So you, you remember seeing it then? You remember seeing her engagement ring? Yeah, it would have been. Okay. Do you have any place where you may have stored some of um, Stephanie's belongings for later on, or have you stored them at the tape or the school or anywhere no. else? Disposed of them all. Yeah, just her bra that was in my bag. But yeah. why, 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 did you, why did you keep the bra? Like you disposed of everything else. Why the bra? I honestly don't know. Don't know. Maybe I wanted a souvenir. Yep. Yeah. Something to remember it by. Probably, but I had no real reason to keep yeah. it. Why the bra though? Why not any other item? I think it was clean. Did you wash the bra? I chuck it in the washing once, yeah. At home or at school? At home. At home. Okay. When did you wash her bra? Tuesday afternoon, evening would have been. Okay. Her engagement ring. Can you think where that would be? No. Was that in a bin? Would that? Do you know if that was taken to a bin? Do you know if that was thrown out a window? Do you know. It would be in a bin somewhere, but I have no idea where. Which you don't know which bin? No. A bin in Leeton or a bin in Griffith? In Leeton, probably. Probably? Yeah. So as you can imagine, at this point he confesses to Stephanie's murder and he does go ahead and tells the investigators where to find her body. With respect, he didn't actually know at that point that they'd already found her body. And even though there is absolutely nothing but a feeling of reprehensible reality when it comes down to this man and He's grotesque in every way, shape or form. I will say that I'm glad that he would have told them because if they hadn't found her body, it's so powerfully important that the family have the opportunity to say goodbye to the person they love. Don't get me wrong, it's not a respect issue. I don't respect him at all. I'm just saying that he's bound to write and he knows it. He knows that he's been caught. He knows he's going down for it. And again... There could be a level of manipulation there. It could be, hey, I'm going to tell the police where her body is because I know what that means for me. And what it would mean was that he cooperated and cooperation is actually really important when it comes down to your defence. It could be that he just felt like it was inevitable, so he may as well hurry it along. It could be that he felt a sense of power. Yeah, I did it. And you'll know I did it because I'm telling you where to find her. But like I said, the investigators had worked really hard on this and they'd already found her body the previous day. He reportedly told the police that he couldn't adapt in society. He said, I would have to require emotions. I have almost none. I have hatred. Well, that's a juxtaposition. I mean, don't get me wrong, there are people who have very low emotional bases where on a psychological level they don't really feel that much. And that can be really convenient. It can make you a good surgeon, for example, because, you know, you can deal with stress. In fact, some people can say that psychopathic behavior will have less fear, more balance in certain circumstances when we're talking about it being lower on the spectrum. We're not talking about Ted Bundy psychopathy. We're talking about it can be quite helpful in certain careers if you don't feel stress and fear in the way that most of us do. But he feels hatred. Hatred is so powerful as an emotion. Ambivalence, well, that's what we'd expect if you say, I would have to require emotions. You'd be ambivalent. You'd be an individual who didn't feel. And I appreciate that psychopaths absolutely feel less. They don't even feel pain in the same way that you or I would. But what psychopaths tend to have is a sense that there is something that they recognize isn't correct. Because yes, they can feel levels of happiness. Yes, they can feel certain levels of sadness, particularly if their dog dies, for example, because we know that psychopaths in particular relate to things that they own and dogs are loyal and they own them. We can see evidence that they can feel. But extreme feelings like hatred, well, that has an opposite, that has love. So like I said, if he was saying, I struggle to feel, and I do things that invoke a sense of feeling. In this case, I like seeing people in pain and agony. I like causing fear because at least it registers with me. But 
Hatred's different because it's opposite is love and it's a powerfully strong emotion. But like I said, this man is full of contradictions and he's manipulative. Now back, of course, to Stephanie, who was meant to be getting married because on what should have been the happiest day of their lives, Aaron, along with Stephanie's friends and family, held a memorial to remember her. Can you even begin to imagine what this would be like? They were meant to be celebrating the beginning of everything because a wedding, yes, sometimes it doesn't work out. We all know that. But when you go on that journey, when you take those vows, when you stand in front of the people that you love and you say, I do, when you promise in sickness and in health and you avoid the bit where you say obey, we don't do that. It's not 1922. But you know, when you read your vows, everybody is there in that moment to share with you your love story and to send you off on a new journey. And that journey is full of potential. Stephanie obviously loved children. She would have had children. There's no doubt about it. I know that I am putting my own belief system on Stephanie and she is not here to tell me that tale nor her family and I apologise if I'm wrong and Stephanie didn't want children but I cannot for one minute imagine that a girl so profoundly vocational, so loving and caring and somebody who chose a vocation with children would not have wanted a family of her own. A family that was stolen future wise by a selfish man. Imagine how Aaron would be standing with the people who love him and who mourn her and knowing what was meant to be. He was meant to have his moment where he turned around and he saw her so beautiful, so radiant, so alive, so hopeful, wearing a dress that she will have handpicked, watching as everything that she planned come to fruition. And instead, they're dealing with her murder. Hundreds of people came. Of course they did. She had great meaning in the community. And they all wore yellow, because yellow was Stephanie's favourite colour. And Stephanie's murder undoubtedly and understandably absolutely rocked the tight-knit community of Leeton. In fact, the students, remember, who she cared so deeply for, they were devastated. They felt like they lost their favourite teacher, but it's more than that, isn't it? It's a trauma. Because when you're growing up, when you're a kid, and we all know, nobody's life is perfect. There are children who are going through trauma themselves. But the thing about teachers, and it's underestimated so often, my sister is a teacher, she's an English teacher, and she's been an amazing teacher for decades, and I mean amazing. And the reason that she's amazing is because she sees potential where others fail to. She sees opportunity where those see limitations. And she is a safe space. She's a teacher that kids come and talk to when things aren't okay. And she's a teacher who notices when things don't seem right. And she takes that extra time. And she was that teacher. Stephanie was that teacher. And those kids going through the motions day in, day out of being brought up and taught up by her Suddenly, life seems vulnerable. Whenever you lose somebody who you know, even when you only know them a little bit, we've all been there, haven't we? We've all lost somebody who we might not be really close to, but we feel a loss when they're gone, you know? The person we might chat to at the local shop who serves us, somebody that we work with, but not closely. You can't help but feel that sense of shock particularly if it's a young death, but God, when it's a murder, and then when the murder is of somebody that you really care about because she's your teacher and you have these relational experiences with them, it makes the world feel really unsafe. For all those kids, from the day that she was killed, every single one of their lives will have indelibly changed. The world will not be the safe place they believed it was. He took that from them. Vincent murdered her and stole safety from all those that she taught. Another police interview happens on April the 21st, 2015. And at this point, obviously, they want to know exactly what happened on the Sunday. He starts to recount 
And when I say recount in detail, but with absolutely no feeling connected, I cannot impress that enough on you. It's unbelievable. And he recounted his movements. He said he'd arrived at the school, been there around 7.30 a.m. But then he saw Stephanie. And instead of carrying on with his work, he, on a premeditated level, went back to his home and, as he put it, picked up his rape kit and then came back. When Stephanie was getting ready to leave, this was around 11.30 a.m., Vincent waited for her to finish her work and as she leaves she says bye to him she smiled at him she said I'm gonna have a happy Easter because of course she is she's gonna marry the man of her dreams he then picked her up from behind putting one hand over her mouth then he dragged her into the storeroom she was struggling she was trying to scream and that's where he killed her then he puts her body in the boot of a car that's also why he got the scratches on his face because she was defending herself whilst he was attacking her. He said that he put her on the floor and he beat her to death, but also he used a clip point knife and he stabbed her in the neck with that. He said, I had to kill her. I wasn't angry or anything. I was pretty emotionless. I just thought I had to kill her. He said he'd hit her in the carotid up artery with the knife to make sure she was dead because obviously that would mean that no matter how badly injured she was she would bleed out so there was no going back on that he then said that he put yellow tape on the wound to try to stop the bleeding clearly he didn't want there to be an obvious mess in the school he then said that he cleaned the high school to remove the evidence of the crime then he drove to his house in stephanie's car parked out of sight because he didn't want to arouse any suspicion then at 1 a.m. in the morning, he left his house and just dumped Stephanie's body at the Kukapara National Park around 2 a.m. Vincent went on to describe how he removed Stephanie from the boot of the car. And when he did that, he noticed that she had really significant swelling on the right side of her face near her eye. Well, of course, he'd brutally beaten her. So she was going to have injuries like that. But he noticed that apparently. Then he placed branches over a naked body and he poured fuel on her. Then threw a match onto her, set her alight on flames and then left the scene. So as soon as he saw that the flames had essentially ignited her body, he felt he was safe to leave. He did actually take her clothes with him. Then he dumped her car and he walked home. He admitted to taking her earrings. He also took two rings, which are her engagement ring and a graduation ring. Could you be any more disrespectful? I know that sounds ridiculous because of what I've just described. You can't be more disrespectful than what his actions have been. But to take the engagement ring, I mean, to take the graduation ring is bad enough. It's a moment that marks her success. It's a moment of meaning to her. But to take the engagement ring, how dare he? That was a ring of love, a signature, a statement, a connector. And he stole it. He said that he wasn't sure where he'd put these, but of course we know what these manipulative individuals are. They're highly likely to lie. So let's just put that on the back burner for a minute. Police, of course, weren't going to let that lie, particularly in the engagement ring, because that was Aaron's. He deserved to have a symbol of their union because he didn't get to have the one that he intended, which was their wedding. He didn't get that. But that engagement ring was a sign of their love. But he denied knowledge of where it had ended up. He had disposed most of her clothes and belongings, but apparently he'd kept a bra. Now, when he's asked about that, he said he didn't have any reason to keep it. Wasn't sure why he had but then goes on to say, maybe I wanted a souvenir. So we know that that's why he did it. It's interesting that when he was questioned, he plays the, well, I don't really know. Maybe I wanted a souvenir. Yeah, maybe you wanted a souvenir because we all know it's a souvenir. We all know you're a sexual sadist. Police also then went on to question him about the used condom. He denied at this point sexually assaulting her. 
And this is something that intrigues me a great deal. And I see this play out very, very regularly in research. And when we talk to offenders as well about the reasoning behind taking responsibility for certain issues and not others. And even though he is somebody who has acknowledged that he has brutally beaten her, slit her throat essentially, you know, cutting a net where her artery bleeds out, we know that he's admitted to taking her body, dumping it after setting it on fire, which you would imagine is the worst of the worst of the worst thing that you could ever possibly do. And yet, like so many offenders in this situation, it's like, well, I did all that, but I didn't actually sexually assault her. It's like admitting that part feels more challenging to them than admitting that they actually did the horrific things that they did to the victim. Because if he had sexually assaulted her, that would be horrendous. That's an absolute felony. He needs to go to prison for a very, very long time. But Stephanie would still be here, traumatized. Yes, she would need to heal. She would have a lot of people helping her do that, right? But for some reason, these predators, these perpetrators seem to struggle with the acknowledgement that they did the sexual acts as well as the murder. It's almost as if it's an admission of the fact that they are not a true man, that they haven't the capacity to be a decent human being and get involved in an intimate and loving relationship. They haven't got the variables and skills that are required. They have to steal it. But by acknowledging that, that humiliates them. So they deny it, even when it is so patently obvious. Not gonna lie, I do feel at a point where somebody has done something so obvious and they continue to deny such a thing, the reintroduction of thumbscrews may be appropriate. Maybe not even thumbscrews, maybe a kind of thumbscrew, just for a different area. You know the kind of area that a guy really wouldn't like to be kicked in? That kind of area. Honestly, I think once you've got the actual full admission, and they won't come out with the truth, and it's all very obvious, maybe the introduction of such a thing could, I don't know. Well, actually, for one, it would actually make the investigation feel like they'd gone ahead and really got to the root of it and felt very satisfied with it. And secondly, I'm pretty sure it would help with any information that was failed to be forthcoming. I'm not queen of the world. This is not going to happen. It's not like any judiciary is going to be sitting there going, oh, my God. Oh my, I watched Emma Kenny's True Crime the other day. She's got a belter of an idea. Is it the, um, is it the hitting offenders with a fish if they don't? No. Is it the tasering during the interrogation? No, no I've seen that one. I, I was on the fence with that. I was like, I don't think it's legal, but at the same time, yeah, I was similar. Was it the scenario where she was allowed to imprison people for three million years and then send them on the elevator to him personally? No, it's none of those. What was it? It was that she was suggesting that we should bring in thumb screws for a very different, a lower region area. What do you think? I'm thinking we'll put it to the vote. Maureen in the canteen's certainly up for that one. Anyway, I digress. Just saying. Sexual predators and murderers, very low on the list of humans who deserve air, as far as I'm concerned. And I say that both professionally and personally. We get to the 3rd of June, 2015, and at this point, in spite of his protestations that he hadn't sexually assaulted Stephanie, of course, he's charged with aggravated sexual assault, because despite his denial, it's absolutely 100% determined that he had absolutely raped Stephanie. My God, what did he do? What created this monster? Seriously, what kind of a human being is okay with this kind of behavior? And whilst it doesn't get more shocking, because you can't get more shocking than what I've just talked about, and whilst this tale can't get any more shocking, in a truly macabre twist as far as I'm concerned, it was actually found that Vincent had involved his twin brother in trying to hide the fact that he'd murdered Stephanie. So his twin Marcus, he lived in 
Adelaide at the time, and Vincent had texted Marcus saying, I'm going to send you an envelope. Keep it safe for me. Terrible Australian accent, but never mind. Make it as real as possible. And then he had posted an envelope with Stephanie's driving license and two rings in it. Now, obviously, the minute that Marcus gets this, he calls the emergency services and is like, you're not going to believe this, mate. I've only got a ring from somebody who's been murdered and I think I've got a driving license as well. It's my brother. Throw away the key. That didn't happen. That's Well, that wouldn't have happened because, number one, that's a terrible Australian accent that I've just done. But that didn't happen because, mm, I'm not saying it's genetic, but... The reaction of Marcus was to sell the rings at a pawn shop for $705. Honestly, some people are just born bad, aren't they? Obviously, I can't say that Marcus is in any way, shape or form as terrible as his brother, but my God, took a murdered woman's rings with her ID, so we, he knows who it belonged to, and he pawned it. We get to June 2015, and understandably, Vincent's brother Marcus is arrested, and he's charged with being an accessory after the fact of Stephanie's murder, because, of course, he helped to cover up for his brother. And, like I said, it's especially cruel. He'd sold the rings. Being aware of how sentimental, how meaningful they would have been to Stephanie's family and to our inner fiance. And don't get me wrong, he did plead guilty to the charge because he couldn't not when you pawn something. You have to give your details. We all know how that works. Eileen Wernos, she was another individual who hadn't got the memo on not pawning the goods of an individual that is deceased because clearly it's not going to look good for you. Now, he actually received a sentence of imprisonment for a fixed term of one year and three months. The short sentence, I will tell you, was not received well by the community. People wanted him to be incarcerated for a lot longer. They felt that at the end of the day, that sentence was pathetic. And they even created a petition to try to increase his sentence. And Paul Matum, the Leeton Shire Mayor, said, I would imagine that the community would feel uncomfortable with that sentence considering the horrific nature of the crime. Clearly, the community are going to be concerned that someone that's involved would receive a sentence of this type. With respect, anybody with a sense of conscience would feel that that sentence was pathetic because it is callous. And we know people make mistakes. People do it all the time. I've made lots of mistakes in my life. I know that every single one of you watching this has made mistakes in your life, but callous is different. Callousness. It's a festering within your nature. It's a sentiment that few of us have. Callousness is deceptive, devious, uncaring. It shows contempt for human compassion. Callous. In a psychiatric report, it was actually noted that Marcus said he felt sick after realising that the package he'd received contained possessions of someone his brother had murdered, but he apparently didn't want to tell the police because he didn't want to stab his brother in the back, and he also felt a level of justification in helping him out because it was his brother who needed the help. It was also said in the report that he had a history of alcohol and drug abuse, and Marcus had reportedly self-harmed and attempted suicide since being jailed. I can have a lot of sympathy and empathy for dependency. I understand that it must be chronic to be in that situation, but the idea of feeling justified in helping your brother who's murdered somebody, no. Nah. The idea of selling and profiting from the rings of a woman who never had the opportunity to have the marriage that she dreamt of because your brother killed her, no. Profiting of misery. It's not profiting at all. In July 2016, of course, it comes to Vincent's case and he pleads guilty to murder. He also pleads guilty to aggravated sexual assault because he didn't have any other choice. He could have gone through a not guilty, he could have put everybody through that horror, but the chances are 
he would have got an even sterner sentence than would have been passed because it would show that he had caused issues and put the family through something they didn't deserve to go through. We get to September 2016. Marcus Stanford, his brother, is released from prison after serving his sentence. At this point, he moved in with his father in South Australia. However, it won't surprise you to know that the family have had to move away because they've had so much negative attention because people recognise Marcus. And vigilante behaviour, I appreciate, is not acceptable. But murdering a gorgeous young woman about to get married and supporting the individual who's done that, that's also not acceptable, is it? I understand where the agony of the community comes in and I understand why they would want him out. You wouldn't want him staining that locality. And I'm not blaming the parents, but I'm saying the reaction of the community makes sense. If you can protect a killer of such gravity, then I wouldn't want to live next door to you. In an interview, he actually said that he was haunted by his brother's actions and the fact that he agreed to help him. He also claimed that he wasn't any longer on speaking terms with him. Good, good. Maybe the conscience you failed to show there has developed through the reality of your actions and the reaction to those by the community at large. On October the 11th, 2016, Vincent's sentencing hearing took place. The court at this point heard that apparently Vincent had a really normal childhood with the judge, Justice Robert Hume, saying that there was literally nothing to indicate that there was anything adverse or dysfunctional in his family circumstances or upbringing. Although I do want to acknowledge, as I say that, I don't get me wrong, I have no sympathy or empathy for this horrible perpetrator at all. But when reports read that there wasn't anything that indicated adverse or dysfunctional issues within the family, I also know that that isn't always the case. On paper, it can read that way, but we weren't there to experience what they went through. And we don't know whether they have told the truth about what occurred. Things can seem perfectly acceptable, but behind closed doors, things can be very different. Equally, I'm certainly not suggesting that his parents did anything wrong. Just bringing in the fact that there'll be some of you watching this who would know that on paper, your family was considered functional and nice. And actually, you know a completely different story. I always want to be aware that I'm not offending people who have lived that life where they've had to deal with the horror when they get home, but everybody else thinks their family's great. Also in talks with a psychologist after his arrest, Vincent said that he had all right relationships with his family, all right. It's so devoid of connection, isn't it? All right. Like I can go through a list of relationships that I've got with my family. Some of them are amazing. Some of them are okay. Some of them are questionable at times. You know, I have feelings. The fact that he says, all right, it shows a low connection base, a low compassion base potentially. And it also speaks to somebody who doesn't have a typical feeling experience. Also, when they did psychological evaluations, it revealed that he had characteristics of sexual sadism. And when you get increased scores on sadism and aggression scales, it means that sexually you feel great pleasure from harming people. And by the way, we're not talking about BDSM. We're not talking about an individual who enjoys bondage and sadism, masochism in the context of a consenting scenario. Of course, we know that happens and that certain people have a predilection for that. What we're talking about with sexual sadism when we're scaling it in this respect is you are an individual who really enjoys creating harm for another human being and pain and they don't like it. It's really imperative that a sexual sadist doesn't feel you're enjoying it. There's no fun there for that person. So high on the sadism and aggression scale, which is obvious from what I've talked about regarding what he did to Stephanie. Also, it came out they had an extreme detachment and indifference towards others, as well in his deficit, in his capacity to feel emotion. It was also said that he didn't even need to feel angry to feel violent. So the normal precursor that we would have when we feel like we want to be aggressive is that somebody has harmed us or somebody has violated us in some way or taken from us. And the immediate reaction, because anger is a shadow emotion, it's the reaction 
to another feeling. So if you think about anger, and I know that people will be sitting at home going, what do you mean? I know what it's like to feel angry. You do. You absolutely do. Everyone knows what it's like on the whole. If you have a normal vocabulary of emotion, do you feel angry? We have different spectrum environments and experiences of it, but we all feel it. But it's a shadow emotion. So it sits on top of the actual emotion that you're feeling. So you might feel angry because somebody humiliated you. You might feel angry because you've experienced a loss. You might feel angry because somebody's betrayed you. So the reaction is anger, but it's what sits beneath that's the provoker of that feeling. To not feel angry, to be violent, is something that very few of us can connect. Because unless it's organised violence, such as a boxing match, where there is a permission based because you have a skill and you're there to have a fair fight, if instead you don't even need to feel a level of volatility to carry out horrendous acts, oh, that's deeply scary. Because that means there wouldn't be a prelude. You wouldn't even know. You could be happily chatting to someone, getting on with them, and then next minute, they're killing you. Literally, not even a sign. A psychologist also said that he doesn't even think about the fact that he murdered Stephanie, had this real absence of remorse, and he says that he basically really doesn't remember what he did. He really can't remember the killing. It just doesn't resonate with him. And the psychologist said there was another thing that was very unusual, which is that he showed a complete absence of remorse, but down to the fact that that was due to the fact he couldn't even remember it. it just didn't register. So when the psychologist asked him to describe what happened and why, he said, I can hardly remember it. I mean, even for a psychopath, we would expect them, as we see consistently within the cases that I cover, they relive it again and again and again. You know, when we talk earlier on about the fact that he kept the bra and that being something that he could remember it by, that's souvenir. The idea of that is to anchor you back to the feeling so I can relive that feeling. But he's saying, can't even remember it. She just didn't matter. That's the expression within that moment. Even the killing wasn't that important to him. And part of me wants to believe that that's just another demonstration of how callous and how fractured his psyche is. And then part of me is somebody who feels that he just wants to disrespect her more. That he likes telling the psychologist that she wasn't even memorable, that it gives him more power to be that cold. Came down to the defense. I mean, no one would have wanted this job. But anyway, let's go through it. He was defended by Janet Manuel. She argued that, wait for it, Vincent shouldn't receive a life sentence because despite his awful crime, He'd been diagnosed with autism and he was locked into entrenched anger and hatred. I know that several of you will now be watching this on the roof because you're autistic and you know that the idea that somebody uses the defense of this to explain the horrific murder and rape of a young woman is really not something that you think is acceptable. I get it. It is one of those that's a little bit blindsiding because Listen, we know that on the spectrum, just like with any emotional spectrum and with any behavior spectrum, certain people have certain feelings. And if you're an individual with autism, you may at times have more of an issue with an expression of the way that you feel. But it's not that you don't feel. You just have more of an issue at times expressing it. You just have more of an issue at times expressing it. The idea that, oh, he murdered and raped this woman, but the reason that he did that was because he was 
He was autistic. I mean, it's insulting. It's insulting. I'm not saying he was not autistic. I'm not saying there is not an issue with him in that way. I'm saying that ain't going to make you no killer. I'm saying that's an addition to being a murdering bastard. It's not the reason. And it's genuinely, as I said, an insult to people who have to manage being on the spectrum, which comes with its challenges. Not least people casting aspersions at them with such ludicrous suggestions. Now, Justice Robert Allen Hume, he called him a highly disturbed individual. He said that Vincent had thoughts about killing people since he was around seven or eight years of age. He'd actually been expelled from a school in the Netherlands in 2003. And the reason for that was he grabbed one of his teachers aggressively by the throat. So it was kind of inherent within his nature and he didn't grow out of it, let's be honest. When it came down to the sentencing, well, understandably, it was severe and rightfully so. So he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The judge actually said, I'm satisfied beyond any doubt that the offender's culpability is so extreme that the community interest in retribution, punishment, community protection and deterrence can be met with only one response. Amen to that. Amen to that. The judge also said that the attack involved extreme brutality and that the offence fell within the worst case category. I mean, you don't get worse than what I've just talked about. He also noted that Vincent's behaviour, where he was just calmly going about his daily life after he killed Stephanie, and also the sending of Stephanie's rings to his brother, was an added disturbing reality to his crime. He also said that Despite Vincent's autism, young age and guilty plea, life in prison was the only fitting option. And I agree, it was fitting because he stole that young bride-to-be's future and he stole it knowingly and he stole it willingly and they further callously committed the crime by sending her rings to his brother. When Vincent's former classmates were asked about him, as they always do, they told reporters that Vincent had always been really odd. He was strange. He actually had a nickname Psycho in school. You know what? It's really strange, isn't it? That kids who go to school with these individuals, they often see it. Let's put it in context. Psycho. There was something so disturbing about his behaviour that it really concerned his peers. And Allegedly, part of that is because he'd often fly into rages and he'd lose his temper. Also, a former boss said that his colleagues called Vincent King Kong, firstly because he was extremely strong and also because he was very hairy. Sorry, I'm not saying that, by the way, because I feel like the way I suggested that statement was as if I was saying he was very hairy as a joke. That's not it. I'm saying that someday he was asked by a reporter felt that it was appropriate to say that they called him King Kong because he was strong and hairy. Anyway, also they mentioned that he wore a t-shirt evening cold temperatures. Just to put that into context, whilst that seems unusual to say and to report, I get it. And the reason I get it is when you look at psychopathy, I've talked about this a little bit before earlier on, but it's absolutely true. If you have psychopathic tendencies, I'm not talking about having to be an extreme psychopath who scores really, really high on the psychopathy scale. I'm talking about a psychopath. You might be working in a normal job. You might have relationships. People don't necessarily think you are psychopathic, but you are. You won't feel things like cold and pain in the same way that people like me. would. I know I'm not a psychopath. I have a hot water bottle with me 98% of the time. In fact, I have a weird ripple on my back because my hot water bottle has literally stained my body. Before anybody writes, stop doing that, Emma, it's bad for you. I know. I know. But I just really like being warm. But anyway, psychopaths don't feel in the way that you or I would. And so that's another indicator. Also, when people were interviewed about him, they said that Vincent struggles socially. And, and that makes sense because if you are on the spectrum, you are going to find it more difficult at times socially. It's why a lot of individuals who are autistic feel the need to mask. When we talk about masking behaviours, we mean that they make this extra super effort to try to fit in and act how they think 
other people are acting around them and it's really challenging because the most important thing when you're working with somebody with autism is to help them understand that they're good enough as they are exactly as they are and to be upfront about that and we're talking about those who are on the scale where they can communicate really effectively obviously autism is a huge spectrum and some of you'll be watching with children who are maybe very badly affected by it developmentally and they don't get to have those conversations because they're non-verbal but when we're talking about individuals who can almost seem as far as everyone else is concerned perfectly like us but really they're going through a huge anxiety issue because they are masking and trying to figure out what people want around them to please everybody else and that's very very challenging chase can you stop doing that apparently he couldn't even look a woman in the eye I suppose we could argue to some degree on a psychological level that that could mean that he has an inherent rage towards women because he can't connect in a way that everybody else can connect and that that could to some degree mean that he feels negatively towards females who may have spurned his advances or rebuffed him at times where he'd wanted to have some kind of engagement but none of that would be enough to cause the kind of rage that we're talking about. And apparently couldn't even look a woman in the eyes. But you know what? I have known a lot of guys, I mean, a lot of friends of mine who genuinely said that one of their big problems is that they struggle to communicate with females, you know, when they're young, because it's flipping scary. And genuinely not looking somebody in the eyes when they're the opposite sex. Who hasn't experienced that? So many of us have, and I know that there's an additional issue when you're autistic, but I'm saying it's still very relatable for all of us. And another employee, and another employer of his said that she actually had to teach him to wash, to shave, to buy deodorant, because apparently he sweated a lot and he had poor hygiene. And she said that one of the things that was very clear was it get really angry if there were changes to his routine. Now, again, the fact that a female Touch such time. There they go. Now again, the very fact that a female touch so now again, the very fact that a female who we work with took such an amount of time to help him deal with his hygiene, that infers that women were kind to him. So the rage again feels completely inappropriate. And we do see that anger again, of course, and it's put into context of change within his routine. And we do know that people who are autistic sometimes struggle with those kind of changes. But it's not just autism. There are a whole range of issues that can cause that kind of reaction. You know, lots of people need a specific kind of habitual routine because otherwise it increases levels of anxiety. We probably all can relate to something like that. But again, none of that is going to lead to you being a rapist and a murderer. In fact, usually sensitive natures are compassionate. Usually people who understand the issues around anxiety and changes to routine know it because they feel so deeply. And that's not what we're talking about where Vincent's concerned. He wanted the world a certain way and he was going to get it. And if he didn't get it, he was going to kick off. I don't feel any sympathy for him whatsoever and I will not have it said that autism was the cause of that. Seth and his family were given the opportunity to give a statement and they did, because there was so much to say. They spoke of Stephanie's character. They were really praiseful, actually, of the police, of the prosecutors who were involved in the case. And they said, Stephanie embodied all that is good about humankind. She made a tangible difference to the lives of so many people. They described the time since Stephanie's death as harrowing and difficult saying that Stephanie had everything taken away from her, losing her, had shattered their lives. They said that they were struggling with the consequences. Stephanie's mother, Marilyn, said that Stephanie was truly one of the special ones. And it's still, she said, hard to imagine a future without Stephanie in it. She was so full of life and fun. What's absolutely devastating is it just two weeks after Vincent was sentenced? Bob, Stephanie's dad, he died in an accident while he was cutting trees. He was hit by a falling tree branch. How much pain, how much trauma, how much loss 
can any family stand. I cannot comprehend how they must have felt in those moments. I suppose the only comfort they will hopefully feel is that Bob has Stephanie in his arms eternally until they get their chance to be with them too. Stephanie's family actually sued the state of New South Wales and the Department of Education. They cited ongoing nervous shock as the reason and her mother said that the despicable murderer had access to six schools and had exhibited behaviours which should, as far as she was concerned, and as far as those suing should have concerned, raised red flags. In fact, their lawyer called for far more stringent screening of staff allowed to work in schools, said that the main reason for taking the actual action was to ensure that the sort of risks that Stephanie Scott was exposed to is not repeated in the future. They came to a confidential civil settlement, but we know what that means. When people settle, it means that they're admitting they screwed up. The truth is that going to court, it's more likely that it would cost them a huge amount more and they still end up losing as far as the state being concerned and therefore Stephanie's family would be able to say how much they got and on top of that go out all hell's blazing saying what a despicable group of individuals had allowed this to happen. So by settling, it's a way of quietly admitting that failures had happened. And a spokesperson for the education department said that guidelines have been strengthened and they said to support the health and safety of teachers and staff when working alone. But that's a little bit too late, isn't it? Stephanie Scott was working alone. Stephanie Scott was unaware that a predator who was odd in their behaviour had access to a scenario and situation where she was at such great risk. And no one can bring her back. And no one's going to see her walk down her aisle, heading towards the love of her life, taking the vows that she would hope to last a lifetime. She'll never have the children she deserved. She'll never be able to comfort her family in other losses, like the loss of her father that she wasn't present for because her life had been stolen. She'll never get to leave the footprints that life offers us as we create memories as those we love and as we create lives when we have the families that we so desire. Every bit of that was stolen because of Vincent Stanford's absolute selfishness. And like I said, if there's one thing that really gets my goat, it's that the defence introduced the idea that autism was the reason and that somehow it wasn't that he was a murdering POS that was the problem. And like I said, when you think about genetics, well, his brother may have shown some compassion about the reality and the end of what he did and acknowledged that he was wrong, but he still chose that route to pawn that poor murdered teacher's, that poor murdered beautiful woman's rings for a cheap book. Really does speak volumes to me. I'd love to know your thoughts. Like I said, what's particularly enraging about this is that this is just a young woman starting a life, going above and beyond for the people that she cared for, the kids that she taught. And she ended up in the state that I have described today. It's not just harrowing, it's just disheartening to think that we live in a world with these kind of predators around us. Give me a comment, guys. Let me know your thoughts. Stephanie Scott deserved so much more. And if there is only one part of this that we can take as some kind of solace, it's that that man will never walk our streets. He'll never get to harm another woman. And the only way he's going to get out of prison is in a box. And like I always say, the great big D-E-V-I-L with his eternal flame, will certainly be willing and ready to incinerate Vincent Stanford for the rest of eternity. Take care, guys. Be safe.
And also I hope that I've made sense today because I don't want to mess up Stephanie Scott's case. Sorry, I'm jet lagged. And I hope that Chase has not been a distraction, but I've been away from him for three weeks. So we've missed each other. Isn't it strange? I'm talking about Vincent Stamford today, a man, a human being, and there's more love in this cat's whisker than he's capable of in his whole body. See you again next time, guys.